Hello and welcome to today's ISHR JMCC cardiovascular webinar series. Uh, today's series features a special issue on cardiac epigenetics that was recently published in JMCC. Uh, and before we turn over our program to our special guest moderators, uh, a few quick announcements. Uh, just a, a heads up, our next webinar series will feature the uh, paper of the month authored by uh, Sakti Sadiyapan on the amino terminus of cardiac myosin binding protein C regulates cardiac contractility. This will be in August uh, with a date time to be determined, so please keep an eye out for that. Uh, just a quick note, we also have uh, the, J the JMCC Scientist in the, Sp the Spotlight podcast, which we would like you all to check out. Uh, you can find it on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Audible, Spotify, uh, many other platforms. And we actually have one of the uh, attendees of the podcast uh, on the call today, so you'll get to hear more about, their, about his work. And finally, just a quick reminder uh, for the North American section of the ISHR meeting, registration is still open. Uh, this will be in September uh, in Denver, Colorado, and we hope that you can join us all there. Uh, so with that, I will turn over the virtual podium to today's webinar hosts uh, for, to introduce the session and the speakers. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much, Ron, for the introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, is that good? Everyone can see my screen? Yep. Um, so thank you for joining us today, everybody, um, for this uh, uh, special webinar for our special issue in cardiac epigenetics published in JMCC. So just to give you a brief introduction to our special issue, um, so this is a proposal that uh, we uh, put forward to, to Rong and Michael and the JMCC editorial team. We were really keen to uh, put together a collection of articles, both original research and reviews that focus on uh, driving signals uh, to the cardiac epigenome in development and disease. So we're going from sort of canonical signaling through to changes in uh, gene expression in the nucleus and also the, um, the epi transcriptome. And yes, we were very keen to put together some mechanistic and impactful papers in cardiac epigenetics um, in JMCC, which we thought was the perfect um, place for this collection of articles. So the guest editors, which are all here today. So myself, who is currently um, at Anschutz Medical Campus, the University of Colorado, close to Denver with Tim McKinsey. Um, Manuel Rosa Garrido, who is an assistant professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, with um, Tom Van Driska being his current mentor. Um, George Anine, I'm sorry, I can't say your surname, George Anine, um, who was previously with Roger Fu um, at the uh, University of Singapore, but as of today is now assistant professor at the Montreal Heart Institute, uh, University of Montreal. So congratulations, George, to your new position. And then we were also supported by as a senior um, member of the editorial board at JMCC to help us through the process because we're all fairly junior. And whilst many of us have done, have reviewer and editorial roles elsewhere. I think it's the first time we'd all been actually guest editors for a journal. So he helped us um, through the process. And we've currently got 13 articles either published or impressed in our special issue. And there's also some more that are currently uh, undergoing the review process and revision process. Um, and there's at least six countries represented. And by that, I mean either the first or senior author uh, from six, um, we have six countries represented. Obviously some of these are collaborations. So there's probably more countries. Um, and today we've got speakers from two original research articles that are in our special issue, Ralph Gilsback and Justice Steenzig. And I'd just like to say a big thank you to everybody um, that has helped um, make this special issue a success, which I think it, it has been and it's, it's going to be, and particularly to the authors as well as the reviewers that have helped us and also to the JMCC editorial team, and um, particularly uh, Jenny Kimball, who's helped us through um, the process. And thank you to everybody that's helped promote the articles in the issue. It's had quite a bit of um, interest on Twitter and uh, Ron's also already mentioned the Scientist in the Spotlight uh, podcast, which is still available to listen to. And yeah, please check out our special issue at the website, it's just down here, um, also easy, easy to Google. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Manuel, first of all, to introduce Ralph. Oh, sorry, just to go through today's webinar, um, our plan for today. So uh, our talks from Ralph and Justice are going to be uh, fairly short, so 10 to 15 minutes. 
each. And then if we could maybe wait till after they've both spoken to have the Q and A. So it gives people time if you have questions for Ralph to sort of write them down while Justice is speaking so we can ask them all together. And if you could then write the name of the speaker to whom it's aimed when you write your questions, and if you could write your questions in the Q&A, just so make it easier for us to um, know who to have a question to. And then we're gonna follow with an open discussion on um, hot topics in the field of cardiac epigenetics, maybe starting off with um, what hurdles there still are in epigenetic therapies, technological gaps, and then perhaps some more career development uh, discussion, given that we have um, two speakers at a slightly different stage of their career. So now I'm going to hand over to Manuel. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. So, okay, so let's go and introduce our first speaker today. Uh, he's Dr. Ralph Gilsbach. He's an expert in cardiac epigenetics and a very prolific author. He has published in a very high impact journal like Cell, Molecular Cell, Nature Communication and Cardiovascular Research, among others. And Dr. Gilbax, uh, well, Dr. Gilbax is currently working as an associate professor at Goethe University in Frankfurt. And today he's here because he's going to give us an overview of his project entitled Diabetes Changes Gene Expression, but not DNA Methylation in Cardiac Cells. So, Ralph, one of you. Thank you, and thank you, Manuel, for the introduction. Thank you, Emma and George, for making it possible that this special edition appeared. I hope you see my screen and you hear me. Everything good. Okay, perfect. So today I will talk about a project um, where we focus on diabetic associated changes in different cardiac cell types with a nice collaboration between different um, institutes and even cities in, in across, let's say, South Germany. So, my slide is not changing. Yeah, sometimes you have, this thing happens sometimes. You have to get out on the yeah now it is i hope it i, I hope it works now so uh, overall my my ins my lab and i guess most of the collaborators we are working with are all interested in epigenetic mo modifications we are also interested in spatial genome organization and how this orchestrates all together gene expression today i will mainly talk about dna methylation so covalent modification of the dna which typically marks regulatory elements and how this correlates with gene expression in different cell types of the diabetic heart. So we started this project quite some years ago and we did a relatively similar straightforward mod model. So we used streptocytocene, complicated word, to introduce a kind of type one diabetes and we waited eight weeks. And on, in these eight weeks, we checked that the plasma glucose is uh, heavily rising as expected. We see after eight weeks that the ejection fraction is decreased and we also see cardiac fibrosis. So we see a full spectrum of a diabetic heart. And then we did what most people do. We did first gene expression analysis in, in cardiac tissue. And we're a little bit surprised that we only see 40 genes to nearly 40 genes to be differentially regulated. All of these genes fitted into the categories which one would expect to be seen in a diabetic heart. So not not really unexpected, the finding, but the number of genes was quite low. So therefore, we decided not to stop, uh, but just to do it a little bit more advanced. So what did we do? We, we decided to fuck sort the individual cell populations. We decided for um, five cell types, we fuck sorted cardiac myocytes based on size. We fuck sorted endothelial cells using a reporter. The same reporter we use also for fibroblasts to fuck sort them, and we use classical staining approaches to sort macrophages and monocytes from the control and diabetic heart. Yeah, shown RNA-seq traces, representative ones, and you can see two things. The sorting works, cardiac myocytes, express MYH6, and also the other cell type specific markers were quite specifically detected. If you then see what, uh, compare the RNA-seq in the heart tissue, you definitely see if you do an RNA-seq or a gene expression analysis of heart tissue, you mainly detect cardiac myocytes because they have the largest volume within the heart. We use the sorting to, to identify differentially regulated genes. And also to our surprise, if we analyze the different individual cell types, we have more than 3000 differentially regulated genes cardiac myocytes at only 200, endothelial cells 500, and so on. I only depicted two of them. Uh, 
And if we now check a gene which is in cardiac myocytes regulated, is it also regulated in the other cell types? And in most cases, this was not the case. In most cases, this was unique. Sometimes we see concordant, let's say a gene which is regulated in cardiac myocytes, also regulated in endothelial cells, but sometimes we even see inverse regulation. This may explain that if we look in the entire tissue that we miss a lot of signals. And if we compare tissue regulation with individual cells, we even see that half of the few genes which are regulated in tissue are not regulated in individual isolated cell, but they are in tissue, highly significant. What could be the reason? And um, we did some, uh, some analysis, only one is shown here, and it is quite clear, it is simply the diabetic heart does not only affect gene regulation in cells, it also affects this number of cells in the heart. So we have fibroblast proliferation, monocytes and macrophages invade and proliferate. So this can also give a, let's say, false positive gene regulation signature if you analyze tissue. Very slow. My slide is, I don't know. Yeah, but and if we further dig into which kind of processes were regulated, then it, of course, we see that also they were specific. Cardiac myocytes show the, I guess, would say, expected switch in, in metabolic processes. Fibroblasts show distinct patterns, and also already in fibroblasts, we very often see that this seems to be response to response to hormones, to cytokines. So already an indication of heterocellular interactions. Therefore, we use the bioinformatic approach to check for known and um, in the experimentally proven um, receptor ligand pairs. And we nicely see that endothelial fibroblast monocytes, macrophages seem to interact heavily. They have um, uh, between these cells were diff let's differentially regulated ligands or differentially regulated receptors, like here shown for RARES as an example, which is the ligand is expressed in fibroblasts, but the receptor is in different cell types. Where um, a little bit an outsider, at least from our analysis, are cardiac myocytes, they seem to be not that well connected to the other cell types. In the, in the original publication, you can see in the supplements, few ex examples where we did a very validation of these results. But we also want to know what is the epigenetic basis of this regulation here. And therefore we did a whole genome bisulfate sequencing, quite some uh, good depth for the individual cell types. And you nicely see here how specific these signals are to this CARDIR, so only expressed in endothelial cells. And you only without going what the signal is telling us, you definitely see that in cardiac myocytes, for example, it's completely different than it looks like in endothelial cells. In endothelial cells, you have way more of these dips, which are normally regulatory elements, let's say enhancers. This also, and if you look on heart tissue, you see hmm, hardly visible what you see in endothelial cells. And also here, it's always important to take into account that this, the heart is not consisting always of the same cells. It is changing. Here from a quite old study nowadays, from a supplement, which I still like, we, we uh, took here as a, um, a region, which is in the, it's a transcription factor associated enhancer upstream of, a, of Zerka. It's bound presumably by GATA, at least annotated. But most importantly, this is a position which is in cardiac myocytes always demethylated in already starting from new, newborn cardiac myocytes it has very low methylation and if we check this one this region it is stable in, in adult and failing heart it's low in cardiac myocytes and we check in non-cardiac myocytes is highly methylated if you take the same region and you take a, an, a healthy and a failing, this is after transverse aortic contriction heart, you nicely get two starts, DNA methylation seems to be altered, but it is not within the individual cell type. So we are already at that time where we thought maybe it's cell composition. And we test by flow cytometry, and there you definitely can see you have 30% of cardiac myocytes in the adult heart, and it's decreased to 20% in the failing adult heart. 
And if we take apply simple math and only take these values and recalculate how the composition changes, if we take the values from all these columns into account, then the calculated changes in cell composition, which we can depict from DNA methylation is identical. So showing that both attempts came to the same result. And if you would assess this region in a failing heart, you would say it's differentially methylated, but the only thing you see is the cell composition changes. Therefore, I guess it's really important to sort. How specific DNA methylation is, can you, you can see here. We want to know which, which regulatory elements are important for these differential um, gene expression programs, which we observed in the diabetic heart. And therefore, we annotated low methylated regions that have been shown to be associated with transcription factor binding. And we see that eat more than 30% independent of the cell type we look on are cell type specific, and they only exist in one of the assessed cell types. And not that the regions are specific, they were also specifically the carrying motives for transcription factors, all of us known to be important, let's say for cardiac myocytes, MEF, for endothelial cells, that's um, kind of transcription factors, or for macrophages, um, the IRF family. This was even more specific than the expression of the individual transcription factors. So we of course asked, and are these signatures affected by diabetes in the mouse model. My slide is slow, but it comes. So therefore, we I only show you two cell types, but it looks would look the same for if I would show four. We simply took all genes which are differentially expressed, ranked them by gene expression, and checked the DNA methylation. Here we checked the genic one, but we also checked the promoter, and we do not see an association between gene expression and DNA methyl in the isolated cell types at all. So we then asked, okay, we are, I have shown you the LMRs. So are LMRs in the regulatory domains of CG, these genes affected? And also we don't see anything. We don't see that LMRs regulatory elements show differential methylation. But what we of course see is that transcription factors which are implicated in the gene regulation, which we see are enriched, like in cardiac myocytes, MEF, we see hypertrophic signaling and in endothelial cells, ADS motifs and ADS motifs are very well known to be important for endothelial cell reaction and gene expression program changes. So I would say DNA methylation is stable in the diabetic heart, at least in the cell types we assessed. So is this completely different than what we have done before? So here is a study which we did a couple of years ago. There we did a comparable approach. We fox sorted nuclei. Here we invented um, a staining method to be able to fox sort fetal, infant, adult, non-failing, and adult failing hearts. And in the human heart, it's even more complex because you don't have only a change in cardiac myocyte proportion. You may only measure cardiac myocytes, but you also have a drastic change in fluidity. So everything is changes. The nuclei have more DNA. The number of nuclei is changing. It is, was even the question, is the fluidity of changing the gene expression? We checked that also in a recent JMCC paper. We, we saw that all things, all disease gene expression changes, which we see if we compare failing and non-failing, are equally affecting the different employee degrades. So I would say a 2N nucleus reacts like a 16N nucleus in heart disease. It's just bigger, maybe it's synthesized. The quantity is more, but the gene expression programs seem at least to me to be conserved. So it's fair to put them all together for the analysis. This is what we did in this 2018 study. And also if we check this study, yeah, I've plotted for you only CTGF, ANP, BNP. All three genes are nicely induced in, in the failing heart. You see nicely the gene expression increases. But I guess you would all agree if you look on the DNA methylation traces, they are indistinguishable. No chance to see a difference between red and blue. This was not the case if we did ship seek. We did, I guess, seven marks. I have plotted here two. And there you nicely see that gene expression changes go hand in hand with changes um, of 
um, histone modifications. And there you nicely also, you have, for example, in CTGF, you have this regulatory element here decorated by low DNA methylation. And you nicely see here peaking new more histone modifications. So you will see that heart failure activates here a regulatory element, but not on the level of DNA methylation. We also did this here systematically. Here are all genes ranked, which are differentially regulated. And we check DNA methylation. And you don't see here a correlation between gene expression and DNA methylation signal at all. So, and this is n equals five or six. So it's, it's I would say it's sufficient and I don't see anything also with my eye. So we also did the same for histone marks. I show you the active histone marks. Uh, merged and here you nicely see that um, gene expression changes in the failing heart in cardiac myocytes correlate with epigenetic mechanisms, but we see here different layers. And if I would show you development, then we speak about a completely different story. In development, we see that DNA methylation is dynamic. We see that histone modification is dynamic and everything goes hand in hand with establishment of gene expression programs. So. To me, it appears that DNA methylation is, of course, very important for a lineage decision that the cell identity is established. But once this is, at least if we check it out, it is very stable. So there is here the, the summary of the study um, we, we published in JMCC, so the most recent one. And we think that with sorting of the different cardiac cell types, um, it was possible to nicely see changes, different gene expression programs. We can also see that the, pro, the genes affected show specific DNA methylation signatures, signatures, but these signatures were not affected by the disease, by the diabetic disease. So DNA methylation we found to be stable. In the end, I want to thank all the people um, who helped to make the study possible. This was um, with a group from Lutzhain, where I was um, before I went to Frankfurt, also in Freiburg, large team, um, mostly headed by Achim Lothar, who is the first author, Ingo Hilgendorf helped with macrophages and monocytes, Johannes Bax in Heidelberg helped a lot also with fibroblasts and cardiac myocyte sorting. Sorting was done by Volker Eckstein and with DNA methylation analysis, we had help from the DKFZ. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, very nice uh, work. Uh, so let's go and go now for the questions. We have two questions here already. So the first one is from Mark Pippin. So, so he's curious uh, why the control mice exhibit diabetic range blood glucose level uh, between 240 300 milligrams per deciliter. And they wanna, uh, he wants to know if uh, this may affect the relative differences seen or not seen in the genetic tract so the, the glucose levels uh, from the control which we might had is what we always measured from all control animals. So this was not different from any C57 which we measured outside of the study. Okay. Good. So. So, yeah, so I guess it's, that's fine. So the next question is from Grant Hutt. Uh, he wants to know um, well, he's saying that the streptos, streptosoticin is a genotoxic, and if he wants, he wants to know if you think that uh, this treatment is influencing uh, the genomic, the genomic independent. Oh, sorry, if if the treatment influences the 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 effect that you see, you know, in the associated hyperglycemia of diabetes. I'm not completely sure whether I understood the question. So, you want to know if 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 the if the treatment, the toxicity of the treatment is affecting the ah, okay. that you are seeing. Basically. So we did not see any uh, toxicity uh, toxicity effects outside of um, the effects which you would expect in a type one diabetes. Uh, it can, of course, be that some cells are necrotic, but we did not see anything which was. Okay. Easy, to, uh, easy uh, yeah, we could not know. I, I, I don't see anything like that. And this model is quite established, so. 
So I also have another question. So why you guys uh, choose the sample at eight weeks? Is it normal to take the samples at eight weeks in this model? A lot of people use it in, uh, after our eight weeks, and this was uh, initially part of a larger study which used also eight weeks. So this was mainly the reason. The, the Of course, you can, the main criticism on this protocol, if you want to make it want to see whether it is clinically relevant would be, I don't think that a lot of uh, diabetic people have untreated type one diabetes for eight weeks. So um, of course it, it would be clinically more relevant if we would have used the type two based model, but on the other side, uh, if we don't see something with after eight weeks of type one diabetes, I, I'm, I'm skeptical that another treatment would sh show anything else. Okay. And Emma, you have another question? Yes, thank you. I don't think uh, panelists can actually write in the Q&A box. Um, yeah, thank you, Ralph. I was just wondering, did you see changes in expression of um, HDACs and HATs that made sense when you looked at your histone modification profiles? No, we never see that they uh, never, I can't say never, but we don't, in, if we, we don't see real changes in expression of these proteins, I guess they are regulated differentially. We only see if the slide, if we take the slide which is open, we see that they're regulated during development for sure, but not in disease. Of course, during development, DNA methylation uh, modulation enzymes like DNMTs are differentially regulated, and I guess HTACs and so on too, but not in disease, not, not that I know. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's another question from Juan Ronda. Um, she said, you mentioned elegantly that bulk sequencing can mask differential express genes uh, due to a shift in cell type. Could it be the same with cell subtypes? Uh, example, differential express gene within cardiomyocyte mask uh, due to shift in cardio cardiomyocyte subtypes. Completely agree, completely sure. Uh, I guess if I would design the same study today, I would do it uh, with single cell techniques. The disadvantage of single cell techniques uh, would be that our detection limit is lower. So bulk seek is still way more sensitive. And the second disadvantage was, would be, I'm not completely, I think the DNA methylation analyst quality is not that good if you do it in single cells to date but completely agree, maybe something is disguised because we have still, let's say two uh, fibroblasts are not a single population, definitely. Okay, and the last question from Dr. Su is, uh, he's asking how about the, how about all the histone modification in human heart failure, uh, such as H3K9, three methylated or H3K27, three methylated? So in, this, in the human study, I only have shown you two, but we measured, I guess, seven histone modifications. We see that all active ones um, go hand in hand with gene regulation in, the fail, in failing cardiac myocytes. Um, in, in case of only polycom decorated, some gene expression changes in the failing hearts. This is more the exception, but during development, we also see that repressive ones are, seem to be very important during the study. So if he looks into the original publication, we, we, we have more than the canonical ones. We have in triplicate something like seven histone marks. We have five HMC and more. Excellent. So thank you very much for sharing your work. So we're going to go to the second uh, speaker today, uh, George. Yeah, have it. Hi, my have presentation. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Ralph, for that wonderful presentation. And now I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our second speaker, um, Dr. Justus Stenzig. Um, he had his, he had a, a medical degree and PhD from the Hamburg University. He's a prolific author and um, he has authored quite a number of papers. Currently, he's the junior group leader. He's a group leader at the um, University Medical Center in Hamburg. Uh, he's in charge of the cardiovascular epigenetics. Uh, he's, he's, the, he's the direct, basically in charge of the head of the cardiovascular epigenetics group at the Department of Experimental Pharmacology and Toxicology at the University Medical Center in Hamburg uh, at Pendorf. And uh, when he's not uh, doing science, he, he enjoys, um, uh, he's, in the, he's in the band and um, he plays the guitar and he, he loves vintage cars like Volvo. Uh, so without much ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Justus to give us his talk. 
and uh, to share his work with us. Thank you. Thank you, George, for the very uh, personal introduction. Um, I hope you can um, see my slides nicely and hear me nicely. Okay. And thank you also to the other um, guest editors uh, for inviting me to present our data here today. Uh, the data is taken from a paper with a complicated title, um, Hypertrophic Signaling Compensates for Contractile and Metabolic Consequences of DNA Methyltransferase 3A Loss in Human Cardiomyocytes, which actually already indicates that there are contractile metabolic consequences or any consequences at all of DNA methyltransferase the A loss in human cardiomyocytes, which I have to explain first. But even before doing that, I have to briefly introduce this person. This is uh, Alexandra Matson, who actually performed like 90% of the work uh, in included in this study and who is now at AstraZeneca in uh, Gothenburg in Sweden. So uh, when people, including uh, also Ralf and many of those present here, uh, started to study DNA methylation in heart disease uh, like 10 years ago, the question was quite simple. Uh, if pathological cardiac hypertrophy, which uh, can be um, elicited by a number of different stimuli and reacts with a quite stereotypical reaction uh, on the gene expression level, reacts with a similar stereotypical reaction on um, DNA methylation level. And um, despite uh, 10 years of research, I wouldn't say that this is entirely solved right now. Uh, of course, we know a lot of things about DNA methylation and have learned a lot more in the last couple of years. We know that, of course, in general, it repressed transcription and uh, more um, also regulates enhancer function. It might possibly influence alternative splicing uh, and so involved in memory function in the brain. And in the also terminally differentiated neurons, it is quite plastic and apparently it does even more complicated things. So um, when we first thought about uh, DNA methylation in cardiomyocytes, there were a number of different scenarios, including it re re regulates gene transcription directly, which is, uh, as uh, I've already indicated, if at all, definitely the exception rather than the rule. It can regulate enhancer function, perform other unknown roles, or it might as well be stable for the life of an individual or a cardiomyocyte. So the last 10 years have yielded a number of influential studies, uh, only just to name a few. On the left side, we have some with, where uh, we have positive evidence for DNA methylation changes in heart disease by um, Jan Haas and Benjamin Meda from Heidelberg by Roger Fu's group uh, from Singapore. On the other hand, we have those uh, complicated mechanistic studies by um, Ralf and uh, Lutz Hein, uh, Freiburg now um, in Frankfurt, uh, and we have something in between. And um, there are different points of views. And we wanted to shed light on this question from a, yet another angle, uh, which is from uh, tissue engineering using IPS cardiomyocytes. And uh, when deciding first to knock out which isoform in the cardiomyocytes, we had, of course, to uh, find out which is the uh, most responsible isoform for DNA methylation in human induced pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. And as you can appreciate from this graph, we observed in iPS cells a high expression of DNMT3B, uh, gradually decreasing until um, the day of uh, the last culture day of EHT, engineered heart tissue, uh, whereas DNMT1 and 3A expression remained more or less uh, stable throughout the onset of beating, DNMT1 being the methylation, um, methyltransferase isoform responsible for maintenance methylation, copying the existing DNA methylation and the other two being responsible for de novo methylation. They are able to um, introduce net methylation on previously unmethylated DNA. So what we did was quite straightforward. We took iPS cells and using CRISPR-Cas9-based gene editing, knocked out DNMT3A, uh, differentiated the cells towards cardiomyocytes and uh, cast engineered heart tissue or short EHT. Before doing anything else, we verified that uh, these had no DNMT3A expression anymore. And we have uh, quite a bit of evidence for that. So we were, um, yeah, we were curious what would happen next. And we already observed a lower total DNA methylation in those cells that had the DNMT3A knockout. They are always presented in blue on the following slides, and um, the wild types are always presented in black on the following slides. This is our engineered heart tissue model 24 well cell culture plates with these small strips of an artificial tissue that can be automatically analyzed and a yield contraction videos like this one uh, that we can analyze via pattern recognition software for contractility. In a previous study, 
which I have to first explain, we observed one striking phenotype of our knockout engineered heart tissue, which was faster relaxation kinetics. You have a maximum force uh, plotted against the time, and you can see that those um, knockout engineered heart tissues had faster relaxation kinetics. And when we first searched for a reason for that, we uh, thought about electrophysiology, but the action potentials look pretty similar. So we looked at gene expression and saw some striking features, which was a different NYH6 myosin heavy chain, alpha myosin to beta myosin heavy chain rate with the faster myosin heavy chain being uh, higher expressed or not repressed in our knockout cardiomyocytes. And we also saw an atrial-like phenotype with an increased expression of uh, MLC2A, atrial myosin light chain, as well as a number of other uh, typical atrial genes, including the atrial master transcription regulator PATX2, uh, which actually coincided with lower DNA methylation at the PATX2 locus, uh, suggesting direct regulation in this uh, rare case. However, the probably most striking feature of all was um, that we normally change our uh, cell culture to serum-free conditions to perform hypertrophy experiments after some time. And in, um, in wild-type EHT, this leads to a progressive increase in force over the whole culture period, even when withdrawing the serum. This was exactly the opposite in our knockout engineered heart tissue, which reacted with a progressive decline in force. We had a closer look at those engineered heart tissues and observed more striking features, including lipid accumulation in, within the cardiomyocytes. These are the cardiomyocytes at the edge of the, at the outer surface of an engineered heart tissue, uh, which become foamy and uh, it contain lipid depositions uh, in the knockout um, engineered heart tissue, also visible in the electron microscopy with lipid deposits inside. And in the all red O staining, where you can see these red dots, which also represent lipid deposition. Strikingly, this was um, in line with an aberrant PPR gamma expression. PPR gamma is a, a master regulator of adipocyte um, differentiation or adipocyte induction. Uh, again, uh, in line with lower CPG methylation, also at the PPR gamma locus. Just to briefly mention, in probably equally important phenotype, which was that. HIF1 alpha was uh, on a protein level lower in our uh, knockout engineered heart tissue and affected glycolysis and glycolysis in turn affected energy supply and function. To finally come to the data from our recent study, we first of all reproduced all the results that I've mentioned before. Again, um, the, the increase in force of the whole culture period for white types and this sudden uh, drop for the knockouts and uh, in this case, we wanted to analyze what happens if we do pro-hypertrophic treatment on those engineered heart tissues. So we used 20 micromolars, quite a lot of the uh, alpha agonist phenylephrine or short PE and 50 nanomolar of endothelin one and treated our engineered heart tissue at the same time of serum withdrawal. And uh, interestingly, what happened was that the phenotype was exactly reversed. So our, uh, knockout engineered heart tissues reacted with this drop or decline of force and when treated with the proactive treatment, uh, they had an increase of force and the other way around for the wild types. This um, coincided with uh, arrhythmia in our engineered heart tissue, which can also be quantified using a measure we call, that we call RR scatter, um, which uh, quantifies the, the change of intervals between individual beads. And in the knockout, this was uh, excessively high and this could actually already be uh, almost reduced to normal by a PE and ET treatment. We first analyzed some, um, some standard um, hypertrophic gene program members like AMP, BNP, and CIRCA, and did not observe any differences between knockout and uh, wild type. So the next question that we asked ourselves is uh, if the pro-hypertrophic signaling was sufficient and which one of the actors were sufficient to rescue the phenotype and if those were also necessary to rescue the phenotype. So what we first did then was uh, to use individual agonists and this is uh, the force normalized to one of wild type EHTs that are not treated and uh, the knockouts were much um, weaker and individual and agonists on hypertrophic signaling already could rescue this. However, the RR scatter could only be rescued if phenylephrine was included in the treatment. We then probed it the other way around and took serum containing culture 
serum containing culture, as you might remember, uh, led to a um, led to no change in force between wild type and knockout. And if we used uh, several antagonists on hypertrophic signaling, uh, the beta, alpha, and ET antagonists, we didn't observe any difference, indicating that the pro-hypertrophic um, signaling was sufficient to rescue the phenotype, but pro-hypertrophic signaling was not necessary um, for, to, uh, for, to maintain uh, normal function. On a morphological level, we also saw a gradual a reduction of these lipid deposits in treated engineered heart tissue compared to untreated knockout heart tissue, uh, coinciding again with the partial rescue of gene regulation for uh, PPAR gamma, as mentioned before. And we additionally analyzed uh, a master regulator of um, mitochondrial biosynthesis, PPAR GC1 alpha. And uh, this was also rescued, coinciding with normalized mitochondrial DNA content as we had observed uh, mitochondrial defects in electron microscopy earlier. From a glycolysis point of view, also the phenotype was rescued, probably mainly responsible for the uh, rescued contractility. And this is a Western blood showing HIF1 alpha and the different con treatment conditions and genotypes. And the analysis uh, clearly indicates that HIF1 alpha signaling or HIF1 alpha protein expression is um, rescued with the PE and ET treatment, coinciding with the rescue of all of the analyzed um, uh, dependent HIF1 alpha dependent glycolysis related um, genes and their expression. Of course, um, we wanted to know if this is directly DNA methylation um, dependent and performed RRBS, uh, reduced representation bisulfite sequence thing and uh, observed that DNA methylation was lower in our knockouts, no matter what the treatment, which is straightforward because they don't have DNMTs to remethylate the DNA. However, interestingly, this is hard to explain, we observed a lower number of differentially methylated regions with the treatment uh, than compared to untreated knockout and wild type control engineered heart tissue. When we mapped this high number of DMRs between knockout and wild type, we saw a lot of differentially methylated pathways, many of which made sense. Some of them were probably just mapping noise. Um, and uh, with the treatment, the number of method differentially methylated um, pathways was lower, as you can appreciate in this graph here, which, as I said, is hard to explain because um, we just think that DNA methylation is further messed up instead of restituted in these engineered heart tissues. Comparing this to gene expression, we observed another interesting um, finding, which was, and this is comparing knockout EHT to wild type EHT under different conditions. And under control conditions, we see deregulation of a lot of metabolism related pathways this, I guess, is mapping noise. And under both control and treatment conditions, we saw a number of uh, rather structure-related pathways um, deregulated. So summarizing our findings, we think that DNMT3A knockout causes a lot of different um, aberrations and problems, some of which can be compensated, especially the metabolic ones, by treatment with hypertrophic or growth factor signaling. However, this probably happens entirely on a regulation level downstream of DNA methylation and does not restitute DNA methylation itself. However, it's compensatable. And I think in the discussion, uh, this I think uh, raises a number of interesting questions. So summarizing this, under control conditions, our engineered heart tissue does well. Under hypertrophic signaling, it reacts with a drop of force. And the knockout EHT does exactly the opposite probably because in the knockout, uh, we have a deficit of mitochondrial metabolism, which leads to lipid accumulation and the glucose metabolism deficit, which uh, reduces force. And this can be compensated by prohypertrophic or growth factor signaling. As I already mentioned, I also have to thank a lot of people involved in the story, foremostly Alexander Matzen, but also my mentor, Thomas Eschenhagen. It wouldn't have been possible without the help of Roger Fu and his group. Uh, in Singapore and a number of other collaborators and of course the funding agencies. So thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much uh, Justus for the talk. Uh, we do have a question um, here from 
Dulin Roderick, um, he asked, how much of the arrhythmia in the EHT treated with the PE81 um, is due to effects of the calcium handling versus the, the transcriptional remodeling of the genes? Did you check for the effect of what of, those, of calcium handling? Well, we did. We, we checked the expression of uh, some of the calcium handling genes, uh, which was more or less normal, but knowing that um, gene expression in electrophysiology hardly ever correlates with function, um, we also um, performed action potential measurements. And um, we were pretty much surprised that the action potential shape, despite a slightly shorter action potential, was pretty similar. So that's why in total, even though we didn't um, specifically um, performed electrophysiological measurements on individual calcium channels, we think that there was uh, not such a big difference and in the end rather attributed our contractility differences to energy metabolism and, um, and uh, structural proteins. Okay, uh, thank you. So another question here from uh, Daniel Jensen. He asked, did you look at the psychomeric organization in those EHDs before yeah. and after treatment of knockout? Yeah, actually we did. And the sarcomeric um, organization in the knockout uh, was pretty similar to the wild type. So the sarcomeres uh, by electron microscopy did not look that disrupted. They retained a more or less normal phenotype and only in those cells where the lipid deposits became too, um, too big, uh, they seem to become, yeah, if there is a continuum, they, those cells seem to become apoptotic and also um, gradually degrade the sarcomeric apparatus. But in the biggest part of the cells, the sarcomeres and the structure actually look quite normal. I mean, normal for, for not very mature uh, IPS-derived cardiomyocytes in engineered heart tissue, but still normal to our standards. Emma has a question. Uh, yes, thank you. It's really interesting, Justice, thank you. Um, I was wondering whether when you have the knockout and P and endothelium one, and you see reduction in a lipid accumulation, I thought that phenotype was really interesting. Do you know that you also see increase in glucose metabolism? So I was wondering if you know whether the reduction in lipid accumulation is due to lipolysis or greater fatty acid oxidation, and whether you looked in the media to see if lipolysis was happening. Or... So actually, we think that this uh, that the fatty acid accumulation, as you say, is indeed a question of a. Um, a deficit in breakdown, which is uh, more or less rescued with the pro-hypertrophic signaling, as, as we observed that the uh, mitochondrial biosynthesis, master regulator, and also other mitochondrial genes are restituted. We think that uh, mitochondrial function is also partly re-established with the pro-hypertrophic treatment, uh, and thereby the breakdown or, and uh, the, the consumption of the lipids is more or less possible again. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, what probably aids is uh, the ET1. I think there is known data on this that ET1 can also post-transcriptionally stabilize HIF1 alpha and uh, thereby rescue HIF signaling, and which uh, additionally uh, drives enzymes of glycolysis and probably aids to normalize the metabolic phenotype. Okay, thank you. Really interesting. Thank you. Um, I do have a question. Although I realized it, you, you could go both for Ralph and for the for justice and for the general um, um, discussion. So when it comes to methylation, there's often this issue, I mean, I've seen it raised in a couple of um, occasions, how the current technology we have of RBS or WGPS often doesn't discriminate between the various um, intermediates between you know, the methylation and how that could affect the results you see. So for example, if you do an RBS and don't see a change between A and B, uh, you're just looking at HMC and, and FMC. There could be FAC and CAC, and how does that uh, tie in both to Ralph's work, uh, to your work, and I think to the general, uh, you know, discussion in terms of technologies and how it could um, prevent some of the things uh, when it to translating this to um, translation, for example. I think you're raising an important uh, point because RBS cannot differentiate between different modifications, uh, hydroxymethylation, methylation, formal cytosine, and so on. So um, I think uh, that this is heavily biased and we're dealing with uh, non-mature cardiomyocytes in our engineered heart tissue. So I think, as you said, it, it does introduce some bias and we're probably mistaking a lot of hydroxymethylation for, for uh, methylation and uh, probably also the other way around. 
but maybe Ralf also wants to comment on this. Uh, if I comment, so I would say that in my hand, in my view, the, the, the only disadvantage of RBS is that you only catch, let's say, in human, I don't know exactly, but approximately 10% of the genome, while whole genome biosophit sequencing catches everything which requires, of course, a little bit more cost in intensive um, sequencing. So it's way more expensive, at least tenfold more. Um, the um, detection of 5-HMC, you can do it with base pair resolution with these OxBIS and other methods, but this would really need heavy sequencing because the modification is not very prevalent. So you have to sequence for a single sample uh, Hundred folds or so. So I guess this is only doable for targeted, maybe for RBS, or we did it for the human study, and there it worked. At least it it shows you that it is an important modification. We do it using a chip um, kind of approach, so like precipitation, and then we nicely see that if there is a an enhancer or a demethylation site to be established, it is pre-marked by 5-HMC. This is very nicely, and we have shown it also in a plus one paper for mouse, but with base pair resolution hard. And all other modifications really, really hard to get. Even if you think of non-CPG methylation, we map that, but there you have to merge large fragments. And there we saw, saw clearly, but what we saw is that non-CPG methylation um, is in cardiac myocytes not existing if you ablate dnmt 3 ab Simply off, out, off. We ablated, I guess, in around E12 or so. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think I follow up to that, but again, this ties into the world discussion. This, um, so now there's nanopore technologies that seems to be, I mean, I, I know someone who's trying to work on that to figure out how you can, you know, tell the differences between some of these modifications and I'm hoping that with time, we'll probably have more papers that look at this methylation studies and try to really identify the various modifications and how they actually correlate to the various disease um, phenotypes. Any anyway, one more question yeah. for, for Justus. Um, could you comment further on the lipid accumulation? Uh, there is no lipid in the medium or is there uh, the CM synthesizing it? I think this was kind of what um, Emma asked, but similar to that. It's from one Rhonda, only Rhonda. So could you speak a bit more on the lipid accumulation? Yeah, so, uh, well, there are uh, lipids in the medium, and we also um, tried if uh, removing those uh, would change something. So uh, if lipid accumulation was something that was explicitly a problem of externally taken up uh, lipids, or if this was also endogenous lipids, and uh, actually uh, removing the lipids uh, from the medium uh, didn't change too much. So we think that, um, as I mentioned when, when answering Emma's question, that um, no matter what the source of the lipids is, we think that uh, it is indeed a block of uh, lipid degradation that causes the accumulations. And we also think that um, the accumulations uh, do not always harm the cardiomyocytes or the contractility phenotype, because uh, we also performed experiments with a PPAR gamma inhibitor, uh, and then saw no um, lipid deposition and yet the phenotype was more or less the same. So I think that the contractility related phenotype is mainly a problem of glycolysis and not so much of degradation block of, of the lipids. All right, thank you very much. I think uh, we, there we have all the questions answered. There's a pass back to Emma. Um, yes, thank you. So we're sort of, we've already started our discussion but we've got a few minutes left for some general discussion. Um, and one uh, question that we thought to, to bring to the table was what the hurdles remain, uh, what hurdles remain with regards to making epigenetic therapies a reality. I mean, we've already mentioned the difficulty with looking at cell type specific or subset cell type specific um, epigenetic changes and gene expression changes. Um, so is cell type specificity and targeting a major hurdle in epigenetic therapies and trying to avoid off-target effects. Does anyone have any? Well, if, if I answer, so I guess this is, it is a problem because epigenetic mechanisms are essential for life. So if you interfere with them, you touch too many cells. So if you see these really nice publications with JQ1, they have very nice mechanistic insights. They have nice phenotypes, but the drawback of JQ1 
at least to my perception, is that it has too many side effects because it works in every cell type of our body, even in fungi, if you have problems with that. And this is, I guess, um, a limitation so far. So we have to find some either pathways which are more important in an individual cell type, or we have to find ways to treat cell type specifically or organ specific. To, to also comment on that question briefly, I fully agree, of course, uh, that cell type and organ specific specificity is, uh, is the main issue. However, um, being a, a bit more optimistic about epigenetic therapies, maybe, um, I think one additional factor could be to find the right timing. So maybe in a crucial phase, like directly after myocardial infarction, um, you, you are able to tolerate the, the side yeah. effects on, on all the other tissues and it might still be beneficial. But fully agreeing with Ralph, probably for long-term therapy, we have to be very, very specific. I completely agree. A little like the chronic, chronic is a problem. Yeah, <laughs> like the epigenetic therapies that are available for cancer. Yeah, like you say, if it's uh, if it's crucial, then maybe side effects tolerable. Yeah, and th there it's on the other side amazing that if you think of our society, Dean, which inhibits DNA T1, mm -hmm. people tolerate this for twenty years treatment unthinkable normally and they don't have heart attack <laughs> from that okay and then anyone we don't have any further comments on that but we're going to talk a little bit maybe about uh more general career development and academic career or uh so just as you're not in the clinics anymore are you still actively in the clinics i wasn't sure uh actually i i almost never was so um I had a very brief uh, period of uh, working in the clinics, but uh, that was uh, hardly more than half a year. And ever since I've been uh, employed by the pharmacology department or by the experimental pharmacology department in Hamburg. Um, and we're doing clinical counseling, that's true, but it doesn't take up so much um, time and, and effort. And uh, the focus is definitely on, um, on research and uh, on teaching. Well, and on administration is everywhere, but uh, the yeah. supposed focus is on teaching and research. And that was that a choice that you decided you preferred to stick with predominantly research, or was that? Absolutely, yes. So it might be somewhat unusual, but uh, I took up my uh, medical studies uh, with the idea to uh, do research only afterwards. So uh, the, my my brief uh, excursion into the clinics was just for uh, personal development just to see if I like it. Uh, and uh, as expected, I didn't. Um, nothing nothing against uh, treating patients, obviously. I, I admire all those people who do, but uh, I was always determined to do science only. And uh, I'm happy with that. Uh, okay, thank you, Ralph. Do you, we're also wondering what have been the major hurdles and challenges for you to, to get where you are today, Professor in Frankfurt? Do you have any advice for the hurdle was time, so it took all more time than we ever anticipated, or I ever anticipated. What a, a major hurdle is, I guess, is simply the number of positions available after after you think you are finished with postdoc. So I was in Freiburg for well, 13 years as a postdoc. So I was never imagined that it takes that long, but you know, we have them to wait until the right position comes and then and then on the other way it it, it nicely worked so yeah it helped having a supportive mentor there in Freiburg yeah support of course always helps so you know another another problem I think that we have uh, when we work with the epigenetic is how long are the projects you know I don't know for you guys but uh, until you get a project that can be published, you know, and it takes a lot of time, you know, I don't know this is your experience with that, but uh, things that like studying methylation, for example, you think it's going to be an easy thing, you know, RRBS and uh, analyze the data and uh, boom, we publish the paper, but it takes so long, so long. Yeah, it's years. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's fast, I mean. A fast paper is then, yeah, from starting a project to finishing up, if you have everything couple of years, but you have to count. This was also long from, I have not all my life worked in epigenetics. So switching from being an adrenergic researcher, cardiovascular adrenergics 
stuff to epigenetics also took quite some effort to learn everything and so on. Yeah, I noticed. I noticed that other people don't have this problem. You know, the projects are faster. But uh, when you are in this epigenetics, that the, all this experiment includes sequencing and analyzing the data, and this one takes so long. Oh. <laughs> hey, so it's ten o'clock now. I think some people are saying thank you. So maybe that means they're getting they're getting set to leave. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody that's attended and for your questions and thank you so much to the speakers and fellow guest editors for all their help for this special issue. Thank you three for thank organizing you. it. Thanks yeah, a lot. Thanks for inviting. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. See you. See you. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.